So who remembers what I always say before we do a communion service? This is my third, third one, so now. Uh Uh-huh, very close, very close. Anyone write it down? You can write it down this time. You'll look really smart next time I ask. Somebody in first service had it written down. They read it to me. It was beautiful. (laughs) This is an open note quiz. Before we do a communion service, I always say the same thing, which is, the sermon today is not what I'm about to say, but what we're about to do. In the ritual that Jesus established, that Jesus initiated, are the deep truths that he wants us to understand. And I believe God has brought you for a reason this morning because God has something he wants to give you today. He wants to give you personally. This ritual is between you and God. And you will get out of it as much as you are open to get out of it. But no, this is God trying to give you something. This is God trying to teach you something. This is God who has a word for you in what you're doing. When we wash the feet, when we eat the bread, when we drink the juice, all of these are ways in this quiet, beautiful, symbolic service that God is trying to speak to you. And guess what? Last night, the deacons, deaconess, myself, and some of the elders, we gathered here. We got the service ready. We ran through the service. We practiced. But even more than that, we prayed for you. We prayed that God would bring the people that need to be here and that he would speak to you. And if we had all day, we could sit here. I would love to go around the room, find out what season of life you're in, what's going on, what's on your heart, what battle you're fighting, what challenge you're facing, what opportunity maybe you're excited about. Because I believe God has something to say to you about your life right here, right now. And if you will ask him what he wants to say to you, if you will ask him what he wants to give you, I believe he wants to give you something. I believe he wants to speak to you today. And so this act, this act of worship today is our sermon. But I will just say a few words uh, before we dismiss and begin the communion service. We've been going through the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs. And there's this amazing little story tucked into Genesis 14 in the life of Abraham. Abraham, as you know, had grown and God was blessing him. And he lived uh, in the land of Canaan, and there are, of course, other kind of tribes and peoples and territories. And in Genesis 14, we read about some of the kings who gathered together, formed an alliance, and went out and went to war against some neighboring territories and villages and cities and stole the people, the plunder, and all that they could get their hands on. And they specifically ransacked the city of Sodom. And this is where Abraham had a nephew named Lot who is living among the Sodomites. And so Abraham catches word that his nephew has been taken captive, been kidnapped, and all the possessions. And it says in Genesis 14 that he gathers his 318 trained men, which that's pretty impressive. He's got 18, 318 trained men, and he goes out to go to war to rescue Lot and to get back the things that have been captured and stolen. So I don't know what battles you're fighting, but uh, I doubt any of you actually went and risked your life this week. Maybe somebody here did. Maybe somebody put their life on the line. But Abraham, in this story, is going out to fight a very real battle where lives could be lost. And it says that he attacks, he catches up with the enemy kings, and at night he divides his men into different groups, and they attack. And they are victorious. And they overwhelm the enemy, 
and they take back everything that was stolen. They get back his nephew and all the people and the women, the children, and everybody that had been stolen. And as the victory party marches, they come to the Valley of Kings. And I'll pick up the story in verse uh, six, uh, 17. Abraham returned from defeating Kedolomar and the kings allied with him. And the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, which is the king's valley. So the king of Solomon, uh, Sodom sorry, comes out to meet him. And uh, then it says in verse 18, this interesting verse. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abraham. This is a fascinating passage. Out of nowhere comes this gentleman named Melchizedek, who is said to be the king of Salem, but more interestingly, a priest of the Most High God. And he blesses Abraham, and we didn't read the blessing, we can get to that in a moment. And Abraham, it says later, will pay to him a tenth of all the spoils, even though he refuses to keep any for himself. And as we gather this morning, we are here to celebrate the Last Supper. This is a ritual that was initiated by Jesus himself, and Christians have kept it from the Last Supper with Jesus had with his disciples all the way until now. But what you probably never thought about was, when was the First Supper? We celebrate the Last Supper, but when was the First Supper? And I want to suggest that this is it. Because did you notice what Melchizedek brought? He brought with him bread and wine. How fascinating. This, the year that this happens, according to Usher's chronology, is 1866 B.C. 1866 B.C almost 2,000 years before Christ would come, be born as a baby. This king named Melchizedek shows up with bread and wine, brings it to Abraham. It's an assumption, I think a very safe one, that they partake of it, they celebrate, and this priest blesses Abraham, and he pays a tithe. By the way, there's no Moses yet. There's no priests yet. There's none of the things that would come later that make this significant, but all of it happens before it happens. I don't know what Melchizedek knew. I don't know what God had revealed to him, but I'm pretty sure that God impressed him to bring the bread and the wine. Because those two things would become so symbolic to the people of God. And how amazing is it that Abraham was the first to participate in this service? He was the first to eat the bread. He was the first to drink the wine. Now, did Abraham understand the symbolism then? I don't think so. But in two weeks, in our sermon series, Learning from Their Lives, we're going to go back to the story of Abraham. It'll be Easter weekend. And we're going to find Abraham being asked to offer his own son. Why would God ask Abraham to offer his own son? Didn't God say, thou shalt not kill or murder? Why would God do this? Because God would give his own son. Because God seems to be teaching Abraham. Because God is so close to Abraham, it seems that he wants to reveal what is going to happen in the plan of salvation to the founder of the people of God. Because it starts with God and it ends with God. And it's all about God. And it's no coincidence that this priest's name, Melchizedek, means king of righteousness. And then it says he's the king of Salem, and Salem means peace. 
He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. He's the servant of the most high God. In the scripture we read out of Hebrews chapter seven, in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews some 2,000 years later says, this guy, this Melchizedek, he becomes a symbol of the one who would come and be our high priest. Because we don't know anything about Melchizedek. All we have is these couple verses. He shows up and he's gone. We don't know who his parents were. We don't know when he died. And so the author of Hebrews says, this is symbolic. It's pointing forward to the one who would come. The one, by the way, who would bring the bread and the wine and tell us it's his body and his blood, which were shed so that we could be righteous because it was his righteousness, not ours. He is the king of righteousness. He's the one that has it. You see, if there's nothing else that you take away from the service today, it is that he provides it all. We can't earn it. We can't merit it. We can't manufacture it. We need his grace. And that grace comes in the price of his very body and blood. And because he's righteous, and because he provides his righteousness for us, we also get peace. And he is the king of peace. And this peace enters our hearts and our lives because he's taking care of everything. He's provided everything. Everything we need, he's got, and we can get from him. And it's free, and it's abundant, and there's no restriction. It's just whether you want to receive it or not. So I was so excited when I put together this sermon series on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I saw that we had a communion right in the middle of our sermon series, and I said, oh, I guess I'll have to interrupt the series, and we'll do a communion. And then I said, wait a minute. The first communion is right here with Abraham anyway. And then we have Easter weekend, and I thought, well, I'll have to interrupt my series for Easter weekend. And God said, no, you won't. Because there's another story with Abraham where he had to lose his own son. And what was that like? And what was it like for God? You see, when you're in close relationship with God, like any good friend, he wants to share his heart with you. He wants to show you what it's like to be God what he's gone through, what he's doing, what he thinks, what he feels. And it's this give and take. And I see it in the life of Abraham, and I think he wants to do it with you too. And every time we take the time to take these few moments and celebrate this holy ritual, this precious ritual, it's an opportunity for you to know the heart of God and know his heart for you and what he thinks of you and how he wants to be close to you. So this morning as we participate, as we break up into groups to do the foot washing and come back and have the bread and the juice, ask God to show you his heart. Ask God to speak to you. Ask God to show you what he wants to give you for your life, where you are right now. I think he has something he wants to give you this morning.